Jesus spoke of judgment, he spoke of reversals. Every time Jesus speaks of the last day, he aims to shock. The surprise of judgment is that insiders will be cast out and outsiders brought in. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Luke chapter 16 is no different. Here we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Often it's known as the story of Dives and Lazarus because Dives is Latin for rich man. Let's read from Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. Jesus is telling the story. He says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a, laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So everything about the rich man's description paints him as an insider. Uh, first, his riches mean that he is powerful, and it makes us think of the Pharisees, because verse 14 has just told us that the Pharisees loved money. He's also a royal figure. He's clothed in purple. And later in verse 28, we learn that he has five brothers. And this points us in the direction of Judah, who had five full brothers back in uh, Genesis. And uh, that, that person, Judah, was the bearer of the royal line. And his name is given to the kingdom, the southern kingdom. So everything about this rich man screams insider. And surely the crowds will be confident of his eternal destiny. He's got everything going for him, right? On the other hand, Lazarus was wretched. His name is a transliteration of Eliezer. Uh, and you might remember Eliezer from the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Eli Eliezer was a Gentile and a slave. Not only is he pitiful and poor, he's also an outsider to the covenant people of God. Yet, as we've come to expect now, Jesus' right-side-up kingdom turns everything on its head. Verse 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Death is the great leveler here, and judgment is the great reverser of fortunes. Verses 22 and 23 would have fallen like a ton of bricks on the crowds. In Luke 15, the previous chapter, the Pharisees had been portrayed as the elder brother. And the parable leaves them furiously standing outside the feast, standing on their rights and despising the grace of Jesus. Luke 15 left the Pharisees outside the feast with weeping and wailing and the angry gnashing of teeth. It's every way that Jesus describes hell. And now Jesus spells it out even more clearly. To be shut out of the feast means the torments of hell. But at the same time, Jesus is making it clear that the outsiders are flocking to the kingdom. Those who are like Eliezer, like Lazarus, they are the ones who are ushered into Abraham's bosom, right to Abraham's side, right to heaven. This is shocking teaching. Jesus is reversing all the fortunes. But he's not done yet. Verse 24, here is the rich man calling out from hell, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Notice here that there is no intermediate state spoken of, somewhere between Abraham's side and Hades. There's, there's no purgatory, for instance. It's one or the other. And both Abraham's side and Hades exist alongside our time and space. There's no uh, soul sleep. Uh, soul sleep is the belief that when we die, we all just sleep. And it's the, it's the belief that none of us are conscious until we are raised together at the end of time. But here, Jesus portrays a conscious afterlife for the righteous and the wicked. The living and the dead, the damned and the saved are all conscious all at once. And not only are they conscious, they are continuous with their old selves. Isn't it striking to see that the rich man has not changed a bit? He was mercilessly bossing Lazarus around in life, and he continues to want to do it in death. Send Lazarus, he says, as though he can still bully the poor man around. It has well been said that hell was in Dives before Dives was in hell. 
That self-serving spirit that possessed him in life is the same hellish impulse that will dominate him forever. Hell does not change Dives. His punishment is for his own hellishness to continue unchecked, for his own selfishness to consume him eternally. Hell is the sickness of this life, unhealed and unending. It is being left in our own mad selfishness forever. But there's great continuity between a person's sick selfishness here and now and that hellish fate there and then. And the ending of the parable shows us how the madness of hell is reflected here and now in the madness of this life. From verse 27, we see how Dive's living brothers are just as hardened as Dive's himself. Verse 27, uh, Dive's answered, But I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will also not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. If Dives represents Judah, who had five full brothers, then Judah's brothers are the rest of Israel. And how will Israel respond even if someone comes to them from the dead? Well, they will be deaf. If they have failed to listen to Moses and the prophets, the whole of the Old Testament, then not even the resurrection will shake them from their hellish hardness. So important to realize that hell is not an imposition of some foreign punishment. It's the continuation of a mad, stubborn rebellion. And what is the remedy? Jesus says, not even someone back from the dead will shake us. Only one thing will shake us, Moses and the prophets, the scriptures. So as I close, let me give voice to the message of the scriptures. This is what Moses and the prophets and the gospels and the epistles are all shouting to a deaf world, hell-bent on self-destruction. The scriptures are saying, do not trust in wealth. Do not trust in riches, in status, in pedigree. Do not trust in religious accomplishments. Do not trust in yourself at all. Come like Lazarus. Come as a total outsider. Come as a beggar to Jesus. The one who fulfilled Moses and the prophets. The one who rose from the dead. He still welcomes sinners and eats with them. He still welcomes sinners. Real sinners. Like me. Like you. If you come full you will be turned away empty. But if you come empty, if you come as a beggar, he will welcome you with arms wide open.